Okay, so good evening. Good morning, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. Um, welcome, Aja Jayasaro. We're honored to have you. You know, to join us all the way from Thailand. Um, so this event is hosted by our DRBU Spiritual Life, and we're truly honored to have Ajahn Jayasara here to speak on us, with us on how can the Buddha's teachings inform contemporary education. He's someone uniquely qualified to, to talk about that topic. And so um, our format tonight is going to be a little bit unique as well. It's going to be kind of Q&A to keep it a little bit more dynamic, where Ajahn Kovilo, who's also on the screen here, and myself will be co-facilitators. Um, we will start out with maybe 50 minutes of questions from Ajahn Kovilo and myself, and then I'll open it up for everyone to ask questions. So if people have thoughts during the, the kind of Q&A, please, you can type in the chat box. We'll keep track of it and then um, be able to ask questions later. Um, we'll try to prioritize DRBU first and then kind of go with everyone else. Um, for myself, I'll be asking questions kind of geared towards educators, uh, faculty, staff, administrators, um, uh, many of us DRBU have really devoted our lives to trying to work on Buddhist education in, in contemporary times. And then Ajahn Kovilo uh, is quite unique because he's actually a, a Thai forest monk for over 10 years, but he's also a DRBU student, a, a bachelor student, which I don't know if there's many. <laughs> And so um, we're very fortunate to have him. And because he's here, uh, he's also a student of Ajahn Jayasaro. So we were very fortunate to be able to invite Ajahn Jayasaro. And so we will just be starting out with some questions, but I thought maybe Ajahn Kovilo could introduce Ajahn Jayasaro because he's much more familiar with him. So I don't know if Ajahn Jayasaro, would you be able to, um, Ajahn Kovilo, would you be able to speak? Uh, yeah, sure. Ajahn, I'll, I'll ask permission just to, I've kept it. I've practiced it under two minutes, the introduction. So um, <laughs> keep it short. Um, but yes, uh, it's a great pleasure to have Ajahn Jayasara with us here tonight uh, or this morning. Um, as a short introduction, Ajahn Jayasara was born on the Isle of Wight in England in 1958. After a pan Asian pilgrimage and much hitchhiking through Europe, Ajahn Jayasara joined Ajahn Sumedho's community in England as a monastic trainee, and in late 1978, he traveled to Thailand to ordain at Ajahn Chah's monastery, where he took full bhikkhu ordination with Ajahn Chah in 1980. After years of practicing in various monastic communities throughout Thailand, Ajahn Jayasara took up the post of abbot of Wat Banana Chat, the largest monastery for international Theravada monks, possibly in the world, from 1997 to 2002. After his tenure as abbot, while he turned to a more solitary mode of living, he also became involved in Buddhist education, a passion and commitment he maintains to this day, serving as the direct spiritual advisor to several Buddhist elementary and high schools. Ajahn Jayasara has offered, authored numerous books, both in Thai and English, including the biography of Ajahn Chah in Thai and its revised English counterpart uh, entitled Stillness Flowing, which is part of the DRBU curriculum. Uh, in 2000, 19 and 20, Ajahn Jayasara was honored a series of royal monastic titles by the King of Thailand. And in March of last year, he was granted Thai citizenship by royal decree. Uh, Ajahn, Ajahn lives currently alone in a hermitage, 100 miles from Bangkok, and has established a further four hermitages, which I had the pleasure of living in for about a year and a half in the surrounding area where his students reside. He teaches weekly at a nearby Buddhist high school and bi-weekly at a Buddhist elementary school and at the Meditation Center Bon Boon. Uh, Ajahn, if it was okay, could those of us who are so inclined uh, pay respects with three bows? Okay, okay, bow. Great to see you, Ajahn. Yeah, it's raining. If, is it? <laughs> Ajahn, if you wanted to start with a, a namo or uh, Ajahn um, Jin Chuan Shur could just jump in with some questions. That is tempting. Okay. Wait, and catch that. Should I start with the questions or were we going to have a invocation? Yeah, Jin Chuan Shur, you can. I can just start? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
So good morning, Ajahn Jayasaro. I first wanted to say that I deeply appreciate you taking the time to meet with us this evening, at least here in, in America. And I've been personally quite inspired by your talks and writings, um, especially Stillness Flowing that Ajahn Kovilo just mentioned. And I thought maybe just to get the conversation started, um, would you be willing to share a little bit about how you began working in education as a Buddhist monk? Um, yeah, from, from, from my first decision to uh, seek ordination, I wanted to live as a, a bhikkhu in a, in a Buddhist country, in a Buddhist culture. And um, in Northeast Thailand, at least uh, the monasteries are still very much embedded in the local society and culture. And so as you become more senior, then um, just by default, you start um, receiving invitations to teach um, to begin with in the monastery, where there'd be groups of teachers, groups of school students um, coming to receive instruction. Um, and uh, from the late 80s, I was um, fluent in, in Thai language by that, that time and started um, giving Dhamma talks and instruction in the local teacher training college and local university and also in, in, in Bangkok. So um, I think that, you know, given that, that um, our, our time and energy is, is limited and there's only so much that we can apply ourselves to in any, any kind of productive way that um, education is, is that which has always um, been at the heart of, of my life. And I think a, a really, a real turning point in my own study and understanding of Dhamma was the coming to the conviction that the Buddhist teachings are essentially um, the most profound, comprehensive and effective um, education system that the world has ever seen. And that I found it um, a real shame that there have been um, very few attempts uh, to try to um, integrate the, the Buddhist vision um, and techniques of education of the whole human being um, with the um, government and indeed private sector um, education in Thailand. It seemed a huge opportunity being wasted. Um, so I I, I felt from, from my early years in Thailand a, a disappointment in how, how little Buddhist thought, Buddhist wisdom was um, coming to play in the development of the society and the economy um, and felt that that would be something that um, I would try to play a part in, in, in trying to remedy. Um, so some years later, um, a student of mine was, who's a headmistress of a kindergarten school and which then also opened a primary school uh, extension, uh, disillusioned also with um, what she could offer in her school. And that's when we first start to get together to um, talk about trying to uh, develop the school along more specifically Buddhist lines in the sense of applying Buddhist developmental principles to the to the school. So that was um, really practically speaking um, my first direct involvement with school called Tosi School in Bangkok. Um, some years later we developed um, a, a high school, a boarding school, which is just down the road from where I live now. Um, and those are the two schools that I have most direct involvement with. So that's wonderful to hear. 
Uh, Ajahn, I was wondering if you'd be willing to talk a little bit about the 12 wise habits and the four areas of development um, for, I mean, I'll just show that on the screen for people who might not, might not know. I was um, looking online and I saw very interestingly on the website from Panyadin yeah. that there's essentially 12 wise habits that are actually really Buddhist virtues around um, yeah. using the senses wisely, knowing the right amount, um, and then all these different areas. And I was wondering if you're willing to, to share a little bit about that with everyone. Yeah, well, in, in, in fact, uh, the inspiration um, to some degree came from a visit to, to America. Um, we were uh, thought it would be a good idea to, to look and see what was going on in other parts of the world, not, not uh, necessarily uh, in Buddhist education, although we did um, go to uh, visit a city of 10,000 Buddhas as part of this trip. Oh. Um, but we also uh, visited a number of um, alternative schools. Um, and one common theme that, that impressed me in, when in the schools that I, that I, that I was um, impressed by um, was that they tended to have a list of, of virtues or ideals of the school which were prominently displayed and which were what's on everybody's lips. And I thought that uh, in terms of creating a culture for a school or an institution, um, this was um, a very skillful way of doing it. And so on return from America, I applied myself to um, going through um, many suttas and um, from them culling what I, what I deem to be um, a number of virtues which would be specifically applicable to a, like a non-monastic um, situation and ones which would be uh, useful uh, both for the, the education in the school itself and then for the children to be able to apply in their ad adult life. So these are um, these are taken from some of the key teachings, whether it's the Paramis or the what we call the Idipadas, the Four Roads to Success. Um, and it's not, of course, um, a, a an exhaustive list of Buddhist Buddhist virtues because I think once you get over a dozen, it becomes too unwieldy and and uh, difficult to, to use as a, um, as a means of recollection and as something which can guide um, a culture of a, an institution. So I set a limit at 12. And, and there are some um, obvious uh, absences, I would say probably gratitude um, is the, the one that I've often thought, well, should I put that um in the group as well but as i say you have to draw the line somewhere and it's not that we don't teach um gratitude and filial piety but it, they're not in, in included in the in that list would you be willing to maybe explain a little bit about the list i put it in the chat box so i saw there's the physical the social emotional intellectual yeah that that's that's um that's a little bit different. So I'll, I'll maybe I, I should um, go into that first, what we call the four pavana or the four areas of, of cultivation or education. And um, the, um, the, the one of the difficulties um, we had certainly in the early days that it was, uh, you may think surprisingly, but quite a, um, a revolutionary concept in many ways to adapt uh, um, uh, an education system um, in lines with Buddhist developmental principles. And particularly we're working with a uh, urban um, audience, uh, urban group um, parents. Um, and these days people in Bangkok, particularly big, big city life and quite secular in many ways. And um, one thing that I've observed over the past many years is that Many of the those who've been through a Western education or influenced by Western culture, which is everybody, I guess, these days, um, tend to look at Buddhism through Western eyes and through, particularly through Western ideas of what a 
uh, a religion is. And so the idea that there is this thing called religion and all religions um, share a, you know, a common feature that they are essentially belief systems. Um, so the, the, uh, the counter idea that I've been um, uh, promoting for the last many years is that uh, religions can be divided into groups or families of religions and that Buddhism is not a member of the belief system family of religions. It shouldn't be referred to as a belief system or a faith, that it is uh, a different kind of religion. It's an education system religion. Um, and so looking at an education system religion um, as a form of belief system religion leads to distortion and uh, all kinds of difficulties. So most people were looking, looking at Buddhism as a belief system religion and assuming that a Buddhist school would essentially be replicating the Catholic schools, which are also already very uh, widespread in Bangkok, um, simply substituting um, like Buddhist Buddha rupas for crucifixes and, and, and so on. <laughs> so, um, you know, had to try to explain uh, this in a way that could be understood with people who are not really devoted practitioners of Dhamma, but more culturally Buddhist. And um, the, 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 the monk who I look to as, as a teacher and mentor um, uh, these days, um, P.A. Puyuto, as his name, Somdet Prabhutako Sajjan, he's the, uh, the, the person who is right, the trailblazer in this whole area and written a number of books, mostly in Thai language, on Buddhist education, very influential. But his, um, his idea was to base it on the threefold training, the Eightfold Path of Sila, Samadhi, and Banya, which I think is, is, um, is, is correct, and, and, and I follow that. Um, because the, the threefold training is like just telescoping the, the eightfold path into, into three. Um, areas of study or training, um, but to use that as a framework for an educate a secular, um, not exactly secular, but a, um, an education system for children who are not training to become monks and nuns um, is somewhat off-putting, um, where many people are already a little bit worried that you're going to tr um, you're going to um, develop children who are so sort of good and pure and kind, but completely unprepared for the dog eats dog, big fish eats little fish, uh, cutthroat world in which they, <laughs> they believe they live in. <laughs> um, so yeah, I won't go into that. That's a whole different kind of conversation. But um, I found it would be uh, better to try and find a different way of talking about the same thing. And so look through the suttas and I came across um, this um, uh, teaching on the four pavana, which is really the threefold training um, in slightly different terms. Sila is, um, is divided into two. Um, so it's, uh, it's the cultivation of the human relation with the material world and secondly, the human relation to the social world. Uh, so it's still, you know, actions of body and speech, but divided according to whether the object is the material or social world. And then samadhi um, is referred to as jitta or the heart. So it's much easier to talk about the uh, EQ, emotional development, um, uh, etc., cetera, um, where use of the word samadhi tends to be misleading. People think, it's just a matter of sitting with your eyes closed and going into uh, refined states of consciousness. Um, so it, it's, it's really just changing the words, the, the branding, if you like, I guess. Um, so four areas, um, education of the human or the children, uh, child, students, relationship to the material world, to the social world, the development of the, uh, of the heart and the, the mind, thoughts, emotions, and then the development of wisdom. So these, so now coming back to these 12 wise habits or, or Buddhist virtues, then um, there is some overlap 
but basically we say like the uh, for the first one the, the human relationship to the material world then uh, the two uh, most prominent here are taking care of the senses or what's in buddhist texts usually referred to as sense restraint um so i, I didn't want to uh, present it in that sort of sense restraint way which is again can be easily misunderstood but saying we live in a confusing world where we're getting all kinds of information coming through uh, by way of eyes ears nose time body and mind so being mindfully aware and careful of what we allow into our, our hearts our lives by means of the senses um, studying uh, there is in fact a sutta in the in the Majjhimanikai that you may be aware of the Indriya Bhavana Sutta so being um, uh, taking care of an interest in what's going on eyes ears nose tongue um, body and mind and then the second is Matanyuta or knowing moderation or the right amount um, and having some sense of uh, questioning our relationship to technology to um, all aspects of the material world with this sense of how much is enough how much is the optimum so matanyuta or it could i would say is searching for interest in finding the optimum amount in our in terms of our relationship to the world around us in the social side then the first is non-harming and non-harming is really short um is is merely sila in other words how we relate to the people around us using precepts uh, recollection of precepts as pegs supports for mindfulness um, in our relation to the people around us um, as the the kind of the key uh, the essence of sila if you like is not harming oneself or others then I use that as the, the, the name for this virtue is uh, not harming. Um, and then the next one is uh, chaka or generosity and developing that generous heart and, and wishing to, to help and to, to um, uh, support those around us. Then the, the majority of these virtues are, are heart virtues. Um, I think in terms of education, uh, particularly the first one, Chanda is is central. Um, this is uh, enthusiasm, interest, passion in um, in 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 regards to study, but one's life in general, and developing that ability to um, to uh, develop, to to take care of, or knowing how to inspire and uplift yourself when you feel down and discouraged. So. Um, uh, intrinsic motivation, learning the skills of um, instilling and um, promoting and taking care of intrinsic motivation, chanda. Um, then uh, kanti, the uh, patient endurance, enduring patience, uh, forbearance, uh, the Buddha said the supreme incinerator of defilements, absolutely fundamental to success, I think, in any endeavor worldly or spiritual uh wiriya jai su uh, sorry that's thai isn't it um sort of uh like perseverance resilience never giving up and i i i um i was recently speaking to the um teachers at the the kindergarten and primary school and saying i think that you know we maybe we're stressing the the kind of the soft or the um, let's say more passive kind of virtues or that's that's how uh, Buddhist virtues are generally characterized but I would like to see um, emphasizing the other side the more active side in particular this uh, um, wiriya and perseverance and um, and and so how all the teachers um, whenever there's some kind of difficult thing come up in the school everyone's getting there and and so just developing this is a a kind of a slogan for the kids you know um we are buddhists we never give up something like this <laughs> you know? so, so um what are we going to do about this this seems difficult uh, we're buddhists we never give up we just keep going till the end <laughs> yeah. so 
you know, in, in instilling this in children from like three, four, five years old, um, so that it becomes part of their identity as a Buddhist, you know, it's not like I'm a Buddhist, I'm cool, I don't lose my temper, I'm kind, but that's, that's great. But also, I'm a Buddhist, you know, when I set my sight on something, I never give up, I just keep going, I'm tough. That kind of thing. So I think that's in isolation, you know, maybe that would be kind of a bit macho, but it's within the whole context of those uh, softer, warmer kind of virtues. Then the Brahma Viharas as uh, the, the basic um, emotional uh, orientation towards uh, the world around us um, and knowing when uh, metta is appropriate and compassion is appropriate, sympathetic joy is appropriate, um, ubekar, equanimity is appropriate, and then sati, of course, uh, probably don't need to say much about mindfulness, so that's obviously super important everywhere, like the um, the, the the prime minister in every area of government, or in um, less healthy times, salt in every in every dish. That one can't really use that simile anymore. Um, but uh, mindfulness present everywhere. Uh, Ajahn Kovalo, is that is that all of them? Are you keeping track? <laughs> Did you go over Yoni so Manasikara? Is that that? Oh, that's in the wisdom. So that's that's yeah. wisdom. Yoni so Manasikara is is. Um, uh, thinking skill, basically wise, wise thinking. Um, in the in the Buddhist context, but specific, specifically, we divide it into two kinds: the the kind of thinking, which is um, aimed at reducing or eliminating unwholesome dhammas and promoting wholesome dhammas. Uh, for instance, if you're very um, angry, then thinking about the good qualities of somebody, the lovableness of somebody, and um, in order to counteract the, the, um, the angry and um, unkind, cruel thoughts. Um, and then thinking um, aimed um, specifically at the way things are, for instance, the reflection on ever nothing sure, you know, or um, what arises passes away and um, uh, investigating, thinking about um, impermanence and dukkha and anatta. In a school system, then it's start off with basic um, good, healthy thinking skills, critical thinking, creative thinking skills, and, and so on. So um, this idea of um, trying to develop this idea that one of the things that you should uh, look to be gaining from your education is the ability to think well. Wow, that's super comprehensive. I definitely would want to have gone to your school yeah. when I was growing up. <laughs> I definitely learned a lot of other things, I have to say. Um, maybe for me, maybe the last question I would like to ask is something that I think is very um, important in our community, especially at DRBU, is something we call ethical sensibility, developing mm -hmm. this kind of inner sense of maybe what's skillful and what's unskillful. Um, I think in the Buddhist tradition, it's called Hiri Otapa. It's something that um, I, I think you've translated as wise shame and wise fear. In our tradition, we we've are still working on a translation. It often gets translated from the Chinese as uh, from tenkui, I think, to shame and remorse. What happens? A lot of people don't want shame and remorse, <laughs> and so I was thinking if you would speak a little bit about that that ethical sensibility, or or and then maybe how a school would nurture that, because that's something we're really wrestling with. How do we? help yeah. develop in the classroom and in our campus life and community. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, 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 prefix, I put this prefix of wise for skillful um, shame and, and fear, although as you know, they're, they're not present in the, in the Pali or the Sanskrit or Chinese um, words themselves. And um, as you say, I, I think particularly um, in, in, uh, Western world, maybe that there's so much um, uh, confusion about what these these words refer to, and particularly in distinguishing between shame and guilt, I think um, is is, uh, is a real um, challenge in in, um, in in America and maybe in a way that's not necessarily the case here in Thailand. Um, I. My, 
my view is, is that basically um, ethics, good behavior, kind, thoughtful behavior is, um, is just common sense. And that the clearer you, you, you see things, the more you understand life, then um, the better you behave. So I, I, um, I think this is, this is where I, I start from. So I'm not in favor of saying you should, you know, feel ashamed of yourself or you shouldn't, you know, I don't think shoulds and shouldn'ts work very well. Um, brings up a lot of either people turn into sheep or else they become rebels and um, they don't become good students. And I'm interested in, in encouraging people to see that if you ask questions about what does it mean um, to be a human being or to be um, a good son or a good daughter or a good husband, a good wife, a good father, a good mother, a good citizen, or, you know, what, what, um, what do you think would be appropriate behavior to, to fulfill those kinds of ideas that, which are not being foisted upon you, um, but you're asked to come up with them yourself. And, and I think that um, the more you have a clear idea uh, of um, good and um, admirable, um, inspiring behavior, and that's right in, let's say, right, right in the forefront of your mind. This is the important um, point, I think, that when you're in a situation where, where you're making ethical or moral choices, then that reflection pops up into your mind. Uh, and that's, that's why it's called a guardian. The Buddha calls the Hiriotipa the guardians. They're the guardians because um, they, they question or they counter and they say, oh, who goes there? You know, that's, um, that's in conflict with your, the goals that you aspire to, or your values. Are you really sure you want to act in a way which is betraying your values? Um, and I think that if, if, that, if that occurs, um, and, you, and you are, basically, then the feeling that arises is what's called shame. So it's a sense of an inherent conflict between how you are planning or about to or are acting um, and your, uh, your, your values, excuse me. <clears throat> As far as, as fear, it's a rational and wise fear. It's not, um, <clears throat> it's not a foolish fear. It's a fear that comes from uh, reflecting upon and going over cases from your own life or from people around you uh, of the, the consequences of actions. And, and you know, when I think um, the lack of fear is really what we would call um, recklessness um so when you're about to do something and maybe you have this a prick of conscience and say that's not a good thing to do and you just say say shut up and you just could go into overdrive you know that that's what the lack of, of fear means and fear means is when uh or wise fear means where um you you don't shy away or try and censor or or just turn your back on your awareness of the consequences of what you're doing and you know, you, you, yes, this has consequences and no, the consequences are not worth the pleasure that you may get from acting in this way. Um, and so again, it's your choice, you know, you, but it's right there and you're, and, um, and it's basically, yeah, this, this, I'm going to get a small amount of pleasure from this limited temporal amount of pleasure. Um, and then I'm going to have to face some very unpleasant consequences. It's not worth it. That's uh, the sort of fear of what happens if you're stupid enough to go ahead. Um, is that wise fear? So, uh, in, in in summary, uh, reflecting wisely, it's yoni so manisikara on your values um, and on the consequences of actions. Um, when um, put in the position 
where where you are pressurized or tempted to act in unethical ways those things spring to mind and they come to bear upon your decisions so it has to be right right there and then and wonderful Ajahn Kovilo would you like to ask a few questions yeah yeah I think uh thinking that kind of shifting the the topic over to kind of uh questions about being a student and um trying to be the best student uh that we can be um and one question which came to mind was about in those, amongst those 12 wise habits, there's the quality of knowing the right amount. And I'm curious if you'd be able to like say anything about, um, yeah, how to, how to discern the right amount with regards to three areas, which are a part of all of the students' life as well. I mean, faculty as well, but maybe specifically thinking about students is what's, how to know the right amount with regards to sleep, to study time, and then to, meditation or spiritual cultivation, how to balance that? Yeah, I, I, uh, first of all, I don't think that there's, a, a, um, that there's an answer that we can come to and say, now I've got this worked out, but for me, uh, so many hours of sleep, so many hours in this, and that's it, I don't have to think about this anymore, because it's, it's a dynamic thing, um, and it can change from day to day or from month to month, um, according to things like physical health um, and um, workload and uh, all kinds of other um, factors. So it's, it's um, um, you know, a contingent um, thing that you're constantly having to reassess. It's not just something you can say, yeah, I got that one worked out. Um, as far as the right amount, then I think it's, it's always important that, that we recognize that the criteria um, that you need to, to make that kind of call um, appears when you are clear about your goal. So let, let's, let's say in, in spiritual life first, for, for like the Eightfold Path or the practice of Dhamma, um, then what is the right amount? Um, to the, which is um, leading you onward to, to the goal. Um, so let, <clears throat> let's say your, your goal is abandonment of, of greed, hatred, and delusion. And let's say you get very, you get very lazy uh, for a period and you, you're not meditating as much, you're not practicing as much. Uh, you realize that's the case. Um, and then you might apply a short-term corrective to say by um, doing an all night sit or doing something um, really goes against the grain. Now, if, if an outward observer might say that can't be the middle way, that can't be the right amount, that's just way over the top, that's um, tormenting yourself. Um, but on the, in the perspective and overall practice on the path to Nibbana, um, then a short term corrective um, may well um, be needed and uh, it's not the way of practice that will take you all the way but when you're straying off to the path to the left as Ajahn Chah would say you have to move to the right even though moving to the right is not necessarily in the direction that you want to go so everything has to be related to the goal um, how 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 does this particular practice um, relate to the uh, lessening and abandoning of unwholesome dhammas and the cultivation and, and development of, of, of wholesome dhammas? Um, the, the simile that, um, uh, that Ajahn Chah used to give, which I've always found helpful, is he said that when we're, it's as if we're, rowing a boat across a very swiftly flowing river. And um, if, you, if you're an experienced oarsman, you know that you, you shouldn't set your goal at the jetty uh, directly facing you, but you point your, uh, your boat upstream a little, um, allowing for the strength of the current uh, to correct the course and allow you to, to cross straight over. Um, and similarly, when we are involved in any kind of activity uh, which defilement is 
involved, which is almost everything, um, then we just got a little bit stricter, maybe than is would be the optimum, allowing for the uh, corrective uh, force of, of the or the influence of, of defilement. So it's skillful means of dealing with defilement. Um, if we try, uh, go directly as we feel would be just the right amount, then we'll end up less than the right amount. So we end a little bit more than the right amount, assuming that it'll end up hopefully with the right amount. Um, with with uh, schoolwork and, and academic work, I think was that, that was the first one. Yeah, it's trial and error, basically, isn't it? I don't think there's any. I I, I don't think there's any kind of general rule here. Um, it's um, time management skills um, are important, uh, as important as, as spiritual skills, and um, learning that interest in learning from experience, and um, not making the same mistake twice if you can, if you can help it pushing a little bit but knowing when to relax and it's it's more yeah it's it's there's no kind of fixed rhythm to it is it i mean everyone everyone's different but but it's more that sense of um getting a feel for balance and 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 one of my favorite stories in regards to this is um of the uh oh, Aikido. hello yeah, of the Aikido master and the student says to Aikido master, master all these years, I've never seen you lose your balance. It's incredible. And the teacher replied, well, I, I lose my balance all the time, yeah, but I regain my, pal my balance so quickly you don't ever see it. So I think that, that we all uh, will lose balance, but it's the extent to which we are sensitive to that and reestablish balance um, and learn from it. With sleep, I would say, if you dream a lot, then that usually means you sleep too much, um, particularly if you dream in the morning before you wake up. That's just, um, if you're falling asleep all the time while you're studying, it probably means you're not getting enough sleep. Uh, if you wake up and you're irritable and, and um, agitated, probably too much sleep, that would be um, my, my guess. I'm 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 in favor of short naps during the day, but I can do that because I live by myself. For like five minutes, um, ten minutes. Yeah, you know, we we get up very early here in Thailand and go to bed quite late at night. But I find if I have like fifteen minutes um, during the middle of the day, I just feel really refreshed. But again, that depends on whether you can do that or not, or um, in a um, in a school or college situation. Yeah, thank you, Tony John. I've got another question, which is probably similarly um, not that easy to give uh, cut and dry answers to, but how about another one of the wise habits, which is using the senses wisely and specifically mm -hmm. with regards to like internet use. I mean, mm -hmm. we've got like, as students, we have to use the internet. We've got to do research and basically we've got you know, living in places that have Wi-Fi 24 hours a day. And um, do you have any any thoughts about how like a practitioner can kind of put boundaries around their internet use or uh, any Yeah, I think first of all, just, uh, uh, I just feel grateful for internet. I mean, we can speak today because of um, internet and uh, you know me, you know me for many years now completely impractical I am with almost every area of material world and having YouTube where I can, there are all these kind people who post YouTube videos and tell you how to do things properly. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very grateful for um, the kindness and the dana that, that is, this is the new uh, field of, of dana, isn't it? Like YouTube, people putting things, sharing their knowledge about things in the world. Um, but because it's so, uh, it's it's not just one world; it's world upon world upon world and wormholes and and uh, yeah, I think it's um, probably most simple thing is before all else is to have time limits um, and and to keep a diary if if you do 
find yourself um, wandering off into um, not so wholesome or helpful areas of the internet to keep a diary of this and be very honest about it, where you've been, for how long you've been. And, and, and that's, I think that's helpful. Um, but in terms of Dhamma practice, as you know, we have this, you know, wholesome and unwholesome Dhammas as our, our basic um, um, go-to. And, and these things are increasing the value, the, the, the unwholesome Dhammas, whether these are uh, laziness or distraction, distracted mind. And um, I think in terms of a, um, a, a test is, you know, if our mind is in an unwholesome state, then the idea of meditating is really unattractive, rather off-putting. So if you think, oh, maybe I'll just go and meditate for half an hour now or go and walk and see what your immediate reaction to that is. And if it's, uh, no, I've got, still got that to do or this to do, or I don't really feel like that, um, you know, uh, then that's usually a sign that your mind's not in such a wholesome, wholesome state. So it is um, central, I think, to all these, these areas, practices, that, that um, ability to be able to tune in to the mind and to the, and particularly in terms of whether the mind is wholesome or unwholesome, it's, uh, it's merit or demerit in the mind. Um, there's, yeah, so um, artificial restraints such as time limits and keeping um, close records of how you spend time and then the more the less measurable um, means of of uh, keeping very close tags on the wholesome unwholesome state of the mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Ajahn. Uh, I think I'll ask one more question. But as I do this, maybe we'll open up the the chat, and if people would like to just start uh, throwing questions in there, if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask Ajahn Jayasaro, then just write them in the chat box and Jin Chuancher and I will kind of curate that. And if people want to be called on, we can call on you. And if not, then Jin Chuancher and I can also read those out. But maybe it's a final question from my end. Um, yeah, Tanajan, so I think most people who come here to DRBU are non-traditional students. I think that's a very fair thing to say in, in a sense. Um, but, and so, you know, all of us are coming here with a very like, pretty strong intention of, you know, really wanting to learn. That's a very, that's the primary resolve in coming here. Um, but of course, you know, schoolwork can wear on you and people can just get overloaded. And um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how to maintain or to stoke like joyful, like basically like associating study and learning with, with being a joyful experience rather than it being a chore. Well, I, I I don't think it's necessarily a, a necessarily a, a choice between um, joy and drudgery. Um, I think that uh, probably it's more practical to to find somewhere in between those two. Um, but if it's if it's a chore and, and and drudgery, then there's always some vipawa tanha there. So vipawa tanha, technical term meaning um, the desire not to be, not to have to do this, uh, that it's not like this. Um, so certain things, they're, they're not fun and it's very hard to, um, you, you can't be on a sense of, you know, joy and blissed out all the time anyway, but um, the sometimes just a matter of being patient and just uh, working away patiently. But what is very important is uh, to prevent this uh, negativity and negative thinking in particular, this uh, all the negativity bound around, I don't want it to be like this, it shouldn't be like this, I wish it was somewhere else, something else. That's so all the ways that the mind kind of um, struggles and, and, and opposes and resists um, things that, um, you know, are like this, you know, so it's, it's like this right now, yeah, it's not so... Uh, not so great fun, but it's 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 like this, um, and 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 I think that 
you know, in that 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 simile, you, you'll remember, of course, of the the arrow and the poison on the arrow, and that sometime, you know, studies like you've been hit by an arrow, but don't put any poison on the arrow. Um, of course, in terms of the bringing up more positive emotion than um, recollection of of the goodness and the kindness and the um, of of teachers and benefactors. Um, and uh, how wonderful it is to have good friends sharing the same values and the same pursuits. And so bringing to mind all the, uh, all the goodness that, that um, is around us. I think mudita is just such a, um, an undervalued um, practice. Uh, you know, it's not like uh, positive thinking or, or, you know, just sort of, yeah, the, everything's wonderful. Um, but again, looking and observing that whereas the news, the world that appears on our screens is 80, 90% depressing, um, what goes on around us, particularly in the kind of communities that, we're, that we live in, is 80, 90% not depressing, quite the opposite. And the more sensitive you become to, to goodness and kindness, then it's just this constant drip, drip, drip of, 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 uh, of happiness, um, just opening our eyes to all the goodness and kindness, just every day. I'm not talking about like, wow, kind of, kind of acts of generosity and, 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 and nobility, but just how we how we live together and how how much we do for each other and how wonderful it is. So I, I think that's um, uh, something that can really uplift the uplift the mind. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Ajahn. Um, yeah. So now we can open things up to questions. Uh, we've got a couple questions that have already started to come in. So one kind of cool thing which Ajahn Jayasaro does at his uh, the high school where he goes to teach is that he goes around. And there's like a Q and A pretty much most every week. And if the kids don't have questions, then he'll ask them a question. And uh, we won't we won't do that to you guys tonight, I don't think. But um, yeah, Chin Chuan Shur, do you wanna? We could, we could have Ajahn Jayasaro ask a question, have everyone type in the chat box that could get everyone engaged. Oh, <laughs> so you can keep that in mind Ajahn Jayasaro. If you want to ask us a question, you can do that. And I can see what people wanna say. Okay, I have a question because I-, I Oh, really? Okay. I, we, won't, we, won't, we won't have time right now, but I'm, I'm interested in how many words that we use in our daily discourse that we hardly ever stop and really consider what they mean. So I've been asking a lot of people, other monks as well as, what is respect? Mm. What does that mean? So one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite um, intellectual exercises is I have a friend who comes to visit from Mars. Um, and he's a kind of a blob, you know, he doesn't have a body like we do. And, and he knows he's incredibly intelligent, but knows absolutely nothing about human life and be very interested. So I, I, I start giving myself the task of explaining things to my friend from Mars. And my latest thing is respect. What does that mean? Um, so that's my question for everyone, if anyone wants to ask that one. In the meantime, I'll ask your questions, answer your questions. <laughs> I can say I was quite impressed when I heard uh, Ajahn Jayasaro went and ta taught at the he went to the high school every week and he also went to the primary school. So he sits there with kindergarteners, you know, in a circle and, you know, answers their questions and hearing those stories. Yeah, they're the best questions. <laughs> they're, the best questions. Because they're the only time I get asked questions where I'm stumped, where I can't answer. <laughs> right? So uh, there was a, a boy of three said, um, where, where did the first tree grow? The first tree in the world, where did it grow? So. <laughs> the first time for a long time i haven't been able to answer a question yeah. anyway okay um i had a uh, one question came from sunna center um, with omar do you want to ask your question omar to unmute yourself there hello ajan um yeah, yeah i can't see wait, 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 where'd you go uh, here I, <laughs> I have to come close to the mic uh to speak okay. um I, I wanted to uh I was very intrigued when you said that you had this realization that Buddhism is the most complete and, uh, and um, useful and effective system of education. Um, I, I want to ask you how or what prompted this, uh, this 
realization or what was the, the, re the reasoning behind it? Um, well, I, I mean, since I first um, started to, to study Buddhism, um, a common theme is how, how difficult it is for people in a Western um, culture, um, particularly in a Christian or Islamic culture, to understand Buddhism. And often, yeah, is it a religion? It's not really a religion, it's a philosophy. Or is it, it's not a philosophy, it's a way of life and all these kind of debates that go on. And, and, um, and I, I was interested in, in, in exactly why there is this kind of gap of, of comprehension and how difficult it is for people to understand Buddhism. And I realized it was because they were projecting onto it this idea that Buddhism is it's basically a, a belief system and they believe in Jesus, for instance, and we believe in Buddha. And uh, if, you're a, if you're a Buddhist, then you have these key things you have to believe in, like rebirth. So, and a Christian may well say to a Buddhist, oh, you're a Buddhist, what do you believe in? So seeing things, every, everything in terms of belief and faith. Um, whereas, uh, oh yes, okay, I can remember. Um, um, after I've been in Thailand for six, seven years, I went back to England for the first time. And, um, and during after visiting my parents, went with some monks back to a, a new branch monastery in the west of England. And we got off a train at about 10 o'clock at night. And we had a, like a three or four mile walk ahead of us. And suddenly a, a car stopped. And all these young people ran out of the car and ran towards us. And of course, I, so I thought, oh dear, what's going to happen, you know? And, uh, and then they surrounded us, and it turned out they were born-again Christians. They weren't uh, thugs or anything. And, and, and one of them just looked at me and he said, what do you believe in? And, and the, the, the interesting and funny thing was, I didn't know what to say. I said, um, maybe you ought to ask him. He's our, he's our senior monk. <laughs> And, and this was when I first realized that I've been, I've given my whole life to practice of the Buddha Dhamma and I'd never formulated it in terms of, I believe in this or I believe in that. So that was when it became very clear to me. Um, again, very, uh, very simply, the Eightfold Path, which is, um, you know, how we, how we express our Buddhist identity through uh, practicing the Eightfold Path um, is, um, is abbreviated into what we call the Dry Sikha, which is the threefold training. And that, that word for training is, in fact, um, the same word in Thai that we use for education. So Sikha is the training, and in Thai language, um, education is Suksa. So that, that also like reinforced this, this sense of this is essentially a matter of training or education rather than adopting a set of beliefs and trying to live one's, one's life um, uh, according to those beliefs. Thank you, Tan John. Thank you, Omar. Uh, we've got a question now from Tomas, BA student uh, here at DRBU. Uh, I've heard you say in Dhamma talk uh, that you quite a few years back, that one of your favorite pastimes was reading books that criticize Buddhism, like, yeah. like this one, like this one. Um, and I'm curious, I'm curious about what benefit we can derive by coming into contact with things that are contrary to our spiritual paradigm. And what skills can you use to resolve conflicts of interpretation? Um, I, I would say that I, I don't recommend this to my students until they've been um, for uh, certainly for the first few years, uh, five, 10 years, maybe um, uh, because it's, you're learning a language and you're learning how to um, approach experience in terms of those, uh, those tools um, that the Buddha gave us, whether it's the four elements, the five, uh, the five khandhas or spiritual powers or the, the, threefold uh, tra kinds of training. So you have to really um, be 
integrating these and learning how to be completely fluent in their use and using them as ways in which you look at the world. So it's a, it's a um, uh, brainwashing in, in, a, in a positive sense, not in a kind of Manchurian candidate kind of way, um, but it's, it's a re-education, uh, re if you like. But then you get to a certain point, and particularly if you're starting to have responsibilities in teaching others or you're meeting people who have different views and don't see things the same way that you do, then I, I, you know, I don't want to get into the I'm right and you're wrong kind of um, you, you know, um, arrogance. And I find that um, it's also easy to get stale with things that you live with day in, day out. Um, year after year, and being able to see these from si slightly different perspectives, um, not necessarily critical, um, but just different way. And I found after a um, number of years reading, say, Tibetan Buddhist texts, particularly uh, very stimulating. And uh, so within Buddhist tradition, other and, and as a, a Buddhist monk also, you're wanting to be able to create uh, links and connections and, and friendships um, with people who come from different backgrounds. And you can't do that unless you have that kind of respect and, and interest in, 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 in other, other ways of looking at life and not just saying, well, yeah, this is, this is it, you know. I may feel that for myself, but I, I, I'm interested in how people who I feel are uh, as intelligent, often more intelligent, significantly more intelligent, but have, have a very different ideas about life than I do. And, and that's, um, that's very interesting to me. Well, wonderful. Um, I see Jason, would you be willing to ask your question next? Uh, yes, um, thank you, Ajahn Jarsaro. Jar um, the material you presented has been very rich. Um, and so I, in particular, I had a question about um, the number 12 aspect of the different um, components, uh, applying the mind skillfully, which is derived from Yanisar Manasikara or wise reflection. And we have this element of learning like in our pedagogy, that's kind of like, in our, it's even baked in, in our mission in terms of our learning is probing and deeply reflective. And in some ways, you know, um, that leads to wisdom. So I wanted to inquire about kind of the mechanism um, that is in your school that is used to kind of like develop the, these aspects. I don't know, or anything else you could speak about this component. I think it's very rich. Yes, again, um, the, the specifically um, Buddhist applications in terms of um, removal or alleviation of unwholesome way and ways of thinking and, and substituting them with wholesome ways of thinking or uh, wise reflection on, on the nature of the five khandhas or of the terms of the three, um, three characteristics, um, reflecting on things in terms of the um, four noble truths, um, taking things apart as, as in looking at the body in terms of 32 parts of the body or the, the material in terms of uh, four elements. The, these, these kinds of um, specifically Buddhist or we could say spiritual um, applications of Yoniso Manisikara um, are not going to be, play a major role in daily life in a school, in a high school, um, although uh, there are, I, I think the Four Noble Truths is probably the one uh, which is most integrated into the school, right from the, the primary school, in terms of what's the problem here and what's the cause of the problem and what's the solution and what's the, the way that we can find towards the solution. So that way of sort of looking at problems is, is very much integrated into the schools. But the, um, the tie looking at it in terms of what we're doing, what I'm involved in, which is grassroots and quite limited in terms of creating something that can be applied um, throughout the, the, um, the government um, public school system in this country, then it's somewhat 
circumscribed um, because we're not just the, the kind of um, system where we're developing here is not specifically expressed in terms of curriculum or approach, but uh, in terms of the relationship between parents, teachers and children and creating what we call a Kalyana Mitata community. So this idea of creating skillful uh, communities, um, all of which, all of whom, uh, all the people uh, involved, whether they are pupils, teachers or uh, parents, are considering themselves as students, fellow students in different forms. Um, so the thinking about this over the past few years and seeing the particular weaknesses of the Thai um, public school system, and it is uh, a rather it, particularly weak at the moment, um, is um, thinking skills and critical thinking skills. Um, and so we've started to, I started to look at different approaches to uh, thinking skill development outside of Buddhist context. And the one that um, I came across and that we're, we've been adapting um, in our schools over the past two or three years is the, the Harvard system, uh, which is called Making Thinking Visible. And there's a lot of very uh, useful um, thinking routines and thinking that we are integrating into the school. And the next phase is developing um, a thinking skill, critical thinking skill um, curriculum, um, beginning with the high school and then we'll go on to the primary school, which we hope um, can be developed in such a way that um, that uh, the Ministry of Education might consider um, integrating into the public school system here. Okay, thank you, Tanjan. Um, we've got a question now from Simon. Uh, he's a DRBA, uh, DRBU student. Um, Simon, are you unmuted? Oh, yes. Thank you, Ajahn. Uh, Ajahn, my name is Simon. Uh, thank you for your sharing. And uh, I think my question is kind of related to what you just described uh, about, you know, adding the element of critical thinking to the curriculum. Because uh, uh, I think science has kind of revolutionized everything by the same time can uh, greatly objectify the world. <laughs> so uh, I myself, I recall sometimes uh, when I, uh, when I was young, you know, ask questions about what is truth, what is birth and death, you know. So I guess as as in this era, uh, uh, students are kind of inevitably encounter those questions. I think in addition to adding the critical thinking element, uh, wondering how uh, about your perspectives in, in with regard to how Buddhism can help inform students uh, of different way of thinking about the world. Uh, so yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, well, science education obviously is um, one part of school curriculum uh, for sure. Um, we, we've just built um, a, a new science building at, uh, at, at the school here, the boarding school, and the, uh, invited the Minister of Education to come and open this building. Um, and on the side of the building, there's um, a handwritten uh, well, it's reproduced from my handwriting, um, and um, yeah, it's um, I don't know how to translate it. It's like sort of the importance of um, science teaches us to um, to 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 know the to know the world. Yeah, this is not such a good translation. I'm thinking, of. but anyway, the the point is that Buddhism teaches us to know the knower of um, of the science. So knowing the world in, in a scientific paradigm um, is essential part of modern education for sure. Um, and we want the world uh, to be more fact-based, science-based than it is at the moment. But um, Buddhism is teaching about the one who, the scientist, is in, um, science is based upon opinion. You can just forget about the scientist and just assume that there's a thing called 
um, objectivity and the, and the scientist is objective. So science generally makes all kinds of metaphysical assumptions about um, the scientist um, and Buddhism questions those. So this is, I think, how uh, it can complement science is saying, well, yeah, but science is the, the conduct of human beings and human beings have defilements and human beings um, have capacity for enlightenment, more or less uh, objectivity and so on. So um, one thing that I, that I do say is that the, you know, the Buddha said that the real world uh, is not the world that we can, uh, we can find in our, on our screens, but the real world is the world um, that appears at the sense doors. Um, and that we, we need to be scientists of the, of the real world, not just the, the world of symbols and, and concepts, but the real world of experience. Great. Um, I wanted to invite maybe Yuan Lin to ask a question. Um, he's um, our, currently our associate dean of campus life. And then Jason, who we just asked, is our, um, I think, residential coordinator. One of the things that is a little bit missing um, you actually can't come to our campus is we can't introduce you to all our different members of our administration, faculty, and staff. Um, but I, that would be one thing. So Yuen Lin, would you like to ask your question? Let you, um, can you unmute yourself? Hi, Tan Ajahn. <clears throat> um, I was wondering um, if you could speak to how the 12 skills are integrated into uh, the curriculum at, uh, at the school. Um, in particular, curious how they are taught inside and outside the classroom and how they're practiced um, by the students. And then if there's time, I was also wondering actually if you had any thoughts on how Buddhist education could help address some of the pressing issues facing the world. Um, for example, climate change, mass extinction, which I feel I think is uh, very much related to this I think emphasis on looking out at the so-called world without considering the knower. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant. Of, you know, when, when presenting this uh, approach and these ideas, and, and it can all seem, um, I, I, I hope, kind of inspiring and, and, and so on. But um, it's, it's still hard work, you know, and... and uh, I can't say that um, it's a, there's a completely successful model there that that I'm sort of displaying today and in, 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 uh, letting you uh, appreciate. Um, it's still in some some areas still how a, you know the ideal. And uh, when you've got in in the boarding school here, you've got 100, 120 uh, teenagers going through puberty. Um, and uh, all the things and the dramas and the pressures and the, you know, of being a teenager, um, uh, you know, the, these and just and the, the pressures of work and, and particularly in an Asian country, you know, the, the expectations of family and then for the younger ones missing home. And um, so uh, it, it's, it's patchy, I would say. And I can't say that it that there's a successful model of integration, but it's um, it's there in potential, and we're trying to develop it more and more. And I see um, that it's becoming more and more successful. I definitely see like a uh, a progression, but it, it's I think having these um, these virtues, it's more that they're there and and trying to. Um, ensure that they're part of the conversation. Um, that then that's just not something that's just left there on the wall, but teachers are bringing them into the, the way that they're talking to, to pupils um, and pupils are including them in their, their self-assessment and in their relationships with parents and with other te with teachers and pupils. Um, the extent to which um, I can say that that's been a success. I, I can't really um, measure it. It's more than like, this is, this is what we're trying to do at the moment. And um, yeah, it, it's more uh, 
my role to remind people and to bring in these things up. And as I say, ensuring that these kinds of unmeasurable qualities are not being drowned out by what can be measured, which I think is built big problem in education over the past many years, isn't it? That this um, quest for accountability and measurement um, has led to a diminution or, or weakening of all those elements of education which um, defy measurement. Um, returning again to the four areas of, of development then, um, we divide these further into three categories. So the relationship of the student to the material world begins with uh, the, phys the physical body um, and all that we need to learn about the physical body and in terms of health and um, uh, exercise and diet, um, um, sexual uh, education, all, all things to do with the body and then relationship to the material world directly around us with which we interact every day. And then the sort of the outer area is uh, the, the environment. So we put quite a lot of emphasis in the school and the, um, the environment and uh, the growing challenges and dangers and, um, and, and questioning what we can do um, to, uh, to, to, to make ourselves ready for this. So that, that's, that's uh, invite the environment is uh, quite a big um, topic in, in the school. And then in the second area of um, education, the relationship to the social world, then apart from using um, customs and agreements and precepts um, as a way of creating healthy community, um, we're also giving importance to uh, communication skill development and to um, developing a um, a wish and a passion for contributing to the wider society. So I, I think that um, these as values of the school and, and, and goals of the education, um, uh, developing that um, tolerance and interest and respect for people of other um, backgrounds and belief systems um, and wishing to contribute positively to the society. Um, I think these are, the, these are something you can do in, in this particular um, environment. I, um, as regards Buddhism in general, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm someone who um, never receives, accepts invitations to um, sort of conferences and um, to promote understanding between religions. Um, I just find they're kind of a waste of time and um, full of uh, platitudes and yeah, so I, I'm not very uh, enthusiastic about inter-religious um, dialogues. But I think that um, what Buddhism can offer is um, a humble, approach. So the Buddha in the Chanki Sutta um, made this very, I think, absolutely crucial distinction. He said that it, it is possible to believe absolutely in something which is not true. Um, so faith is not a proof that what you believe in is true. And I think in religious group groups, um, there is this circular reasoning. Um, it's true because I believe it. I believe it because it's true. Um, and, and so I think as Buddhists, we can say, well, look, let's all start. Let's be real here. And we'll say like, okay, I'm a Buddhist. Um, I, I believe in rebirth. Um, but I don't know. I don't have a, I can't remember my past lives. Um, so I don't know whether there is such a thing. I don't know that the Buddha was enlightened in India 2,500 years ago, but I believe it for these reasons. 
and then the Christian and the Jew, the Muslim, and they say, well, yeah, I don't know whether Jesus died on the cross for my, I believe it's so, and this is why I believe it, but I don't actually know. And then the Muslim says he doesn't really know, she doesn't really know, but she believes. And so rather than saying all religions are teaching the same thing and we're all going the same path and just using different words, which uh, I, I, don't, I don't believe at all, uh, and trying to find some kind of unity in some uh, very high and, and uh, unrealistic plane of being, I think we can find um, a really constructive unity in accepting the basic truth that nobody knows. You don't really know. Um, and believing isn't the same as knowing. And um, so that's how I think that Buddhist wisdom would contribute to understanding between religions, starting off with making distinction between what you believe and what you know, according to the Buddhist teachings in the Janki Sutta. possibly controversial material there. Uh, we only have f five minutes left. Um, Donjon, would you want to, I mean, being able to see, uh, you know, the little squares of everyone who's here and maybe getting, having gotten a sense of the questions we're asking, um, would you want to, I mean, kind of what you just said is kind of a summary, um, but it, would you have any kind of closing words that you want to, to add? Oh, I don't know. I'm not so good on closing words. Um, uh, no, you say something. Okay. I, have, I, I just heard from our, our participants, people were texting me. I Doug wanted to say something. I, okay, let, me, uh, let me add him to our spotlight here. Okay, Doug, let me unmute you here. One second. Here you go. Okay, go. Thank you very much. We really appreciated your, the opportunity. I uh, just have one question maybe in a couple minutes uh, the way that you're presenting buddhism here is very close in a lot of ways to what we've been trying to do uh both in the high schools college and so forth um in terms of it seems like in do you have quite a bit of time to work with your teachers uh to um in, in uh, have a chance to meditate and work with them to have the inner workings of what you're describing because it seems like uh, what you're what you're doing for the students is giving them an opportunity to experience their inner world of emotions and visceral responses not so much an intellectual knowledge of something but a feeling of something and taking them through those feelings so they feel the good feelings positive feelings as an actual, their, their, their empirical evidence is their feelings mm. for high school, you know, for younger, younger kids. Well, for anyone, but uh, mm. do you have quite a bit of time to work with your teachers so they can uh, communicate that level of sensitivities and what they're doing around this material? Can I just add one thing there? I just want to mention that Doug is actually the, our VP of finance and administration, technically, but he does everything at the university. So he helps counsel students, leads our, our contemplative exercise immersion, and uh, I don't know, teaches a bunch of classes. So I just want to mention who Doug is, so I give some context. So he's yeah, working he's actively with us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. In fact, I probably spend more time with teachers than, than with uh, the pupils. Um, so part of the um, agreement for any teacher who, um, who comes to, to, to work at the schools, um, they have to sign up for, at least, um, we do, I do one, uh, an annual seven day meditation retreat, uh, which, which everyone um, is compulsory for all the teachers here. Um, and um, then there are, there are other one day retreats, which are also, there are a number throughout the year um, of which um, parents uh, need to sign up for half, half of them uh, so they can choose. So they need to, need to get everybody on board, the teachers and the pupil and the parents in particular, because if the teachers are, uh, and we're teaching something at home at school and the parents are teaching something different at home, then obviously confusing for, for, the, um, for the children. The uh, when I go to the school on 
uh, here on every Wednesday morning and, and twice a month to the school in Bangkok, then I'll spend a whole morning, which is um, divided into time with the pupils and time with teachers. So different groups of teachers and, and teachers with individual problems, whether they're um, problems at work, problems with their colleagues or, or spiritual problems, meditation problems, then we, then we, um, uh, we, we scale, I schedule um, interviews with, uh, with teachers, both uh, group interviews and personal interviews during, during the time I'm at school. Yeah. So yeah, I, it's, uh, I, I, I give great importance to the, to the teachers. They really have to be the ones that um, are committed to this because I'm, I'm there very rarely. I mean, I'm, I'm just uh, more someone to give some uh, moral and, and support and guidance every now and again. It's really up to the teachers. Hi, John, it's been wonderful having you. It's been great seeing everyone, everyone who's come, friends from Thailand, lots of good people here in America. And um, John, if we could maybe pay respects one more time for anyone who's, who's interested. Okay. Um, yeah, very much appreciate you being able to join us, Ajahn. It was quite um, inspiring to hear all the work you're doing with, with young people, <laughs> especially for us. We've, we've also tried to do the same work and seeing the, the depth of thought you put into it. And so I, yeah, well, in a, in a post-COVID world, whenever that manifests, then uh, you or anyone from the RB are very welcome to come visit here. And, yeah. and uh, I, you know, as soon as I, next time I get to America, then I, I, I always go to a Baigiri, so I'll, I'll scoot along to see you as well, if I may. Okay. Oh, yes. We'll be very happy to host you. you come in. And I appreciate everyone who's showing up on a Monday night. I know students for sure are doing homework. That's probably a night you need to do reading for the rest of the week. And faculty are preparing for classes. So happy everyone could come out. <laughs> okay, so that see you. concludes our uh, event.